glad to have you join us this morning uh, for our services. Okay, nonetheless, we're going to go ahead. Uh, this morning we'll have a word of prayer, and then we're going to uh, we're going to sing together. So if you've got a song book there at home, uh, it is uh, it is in page number three twenty three. If you've got a song book there at home, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started right now. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the opportunity we have this morning, Lord, to come together, Father, uh, and to worship you. And Father, we pray that we would do exactly that this morning. Lord, help us to turn off all the other distractions. Uh, Lord, uh, it's not time to scroll, uh, Lord, through our feeds, Father, or anything else. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to focus for just a little while here uh, on you uh, and on the things of God. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got a songbook there at home. Uh, go ahead and turn to page number 323. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't see that. Other words, it's up on the screen? Okay. Uh, 323, stand up. Uh, or no, we're doing standing on promises. Standing on promises. Here we go. Oh, that's old mic. My bad. All right. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. I have to look at the screen. Oh, this is going to be, this is, what is, I love doing this. Sunday mornings are the best. Yep. Okay, so I need to. I need to move around. Okay, that's fine. Here we go. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's word. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God on the last. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Oh, there's one more verse? Okay, well, we're doing it again. Last verse. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listing every moment to the Spirit call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.
uh, go ahead and uh, put it either, you can either send it to me or uh, just put it into the comments there uh, and we'll try and get it out we'll make sure that we uh, get them so that we can uh, get them added to uh, everybody's prayer list and so uh, so let's do that real quick uh, where is my there it is uh, so anybody need to add something? Oh, Brian, what a shock. Surprising. You hardly ever have anything to add to the prayer list. Okay. Uh, yeah, Brian and Natalie are going to the dentist tomorrow, so uh, make sure to keep them uh, in your prayers. Uh, so uh, keep Wait, that in mind. Keep their mother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... All right. Yes, Allison. Um, Presently, I'm going into the high school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually, already are in high school. Well, I yeah. am in high school, but I'm going. Yeah. It's still difficult. Yeah. Actual yeah. Actual yes. <laughs> Pray for Allison as she goes into high school uh, that she won't die prematurely at the hands of her parents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, pray that she won't be pray she won't be bullied for playing Minecraft incessantly. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, llama llama. Uh, anyways, yes. 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 Clayton and. Yes, Clay, Clay and Alexis would like you to know they're still planning on getting married, so there's that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, be praying that uh, everything, the, that everybody is better, uh, everybody's feeling better by wedding, nobody is sick, uh, everybody that's flying in, uh, so yeah, so lots of people uh, coming in, so uh, be praying for, uh, for all of that. So, uh, just be praying for the wedding that it'll all go off without a hitch. Uh, so anybody else? Yes. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, pray for Alexis' family as they fly back from Israel, uh, so keep them in your prayers uh, as well, so. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, anything else we need to add? All right, let's go ahead, and we're going to sing again. Take your songbook if you're at home, uh, and turn to page 322. Page 322, you should probably just stand here. Uh, huh? No, I'm gonna do that when I do offering. Uh, so. Uh. <laughs> Here we go. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Here we go. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, for Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. 
stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer. Where duty calls or danger, but never will thing there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. It, <coughs> the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. It's on. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, so, uh, but we do want you to take time to give. It is important. Uh, and so, the, uh, <laughs> uh, it, we, uh, we want you to take the time to do that. I know uh, may, for some people it may kind of seem, right, like, uh, why should I give if, uh, if we're not in a building or whatever it may be, but uh, all of this stuff, doing all this stuff online, if you are staying at home, uh, because of uh, because of health concerns and stuff like that, all of this online stuff costs money, right? It costs money for the programs to run it, um, and uh, the the obviously we've we've tried to upgrade some things and do some different things, and so uh, with uh, with like the the slides and stuff like that, uh, that program by itself is 109 bucks a month, uh, and so that doesn't include. Uh, the other programs that we use, like uh, eCam, which is actually the program through which the streaming uh, comes, it's not as simple as just having an iPhone and uh, looking into an iPhone, uh, right? And so there's a lot that is involved, and there's uh, so there's a lot of financial uh, uh, things, obligations that go along with being able to bring us into your home every uh, every Sunday and every. Uh, Thursday night, and so uh, giving remains important, uh, right? Uh, it's not uh, because of COVID that doesn't mean that uh, all of a sudden you know giving no longer matters. And so I know for some uh, it's been uh, it's been difficult for you to be able to give over the course of this time, and so but uh, we want to encourage you to give, and so uh, so we hope that you'll take the time to give while we're uh, while you're doing that. Uh, we uh, we'll go ahead and do. Uh, testimonies uh, uh, real quick as well. So uh, anybody, God did something for you this week? Uh, yes, Ethan. Yeah, <laughs> Ethan did roll a quad down the side of a mountain and he didn't die, uh, which was uh, which was good because otherwise then his, uh, I, I don't know, he, he says it happened by accident, but he was with uh, with his girlfriend's family when it happened. And so uh, it's a good possibility that her father just accidentally bumped his quad uh, a little. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but no, so, uh, but yeah, that is, uh, we're happy that you didn't die too. Wow. Look, yeah, I guess. Um, <laughs> your mom, your mom's happy you didn't die. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anybody else, God did something for you this week. Doesn't have to even be this week. Maybe you just did something for you in your lifetime. 
Uh, go ahead, Allison. Yeah. Good. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, anybody else? God did something for you this week. Mom says, or Dad says, praise God for providing leadership and special gifts to upgrade laptop for church broadcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's uh, somebody that we do not know uh, has pledged to give some money to help upgrade Dad's laptop for the case of streaming, and so. Uh, so we are thankful for that as well. Uh, they're not pledging all of it, but uh, they are pledging a portion of it, and so we're thankful for that. So uh, keep that in mind uh, as well. Then uh, Robin asked that we pray uh, for her back. I guess her back has been hurting, and so uh, pray for her. I'm sorry? Back of her legs. Sorry, I thought it was her back. So, um, But, yeah, the back of her legs. So uh, keep that uh Keep that in your prayers uh, then as well. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer real quick, and then uh, we're going to jump right into things. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the opportunity we have this morning, Lord, uh, to join together, Father, and to worship you, God. There's nothing like it. We love it. Uh, Lord, we love to gather around the Bible, God. Uh, Lord, none of these people are here today to hear from me, but they sure are here to hear from you. And so, Father, uh, I pray, God, that you'd speak through me uh, to your people this morning, God. We do pray, Lord, for Robin in the back of her leg, God, that you would uh, you'd just touch her and heal her, Lord. We pray for Alexis's family as they return, God. Uh, pray for uh, Brian and Natalie as they go to the dentist, Father. Um, Lord, just uh, a lot of different things kind of going on, Lord. We're trying to get ready for the wedding. We pray that everything there would go smoothly, Lord. Uh, Lord, that uh, you'd remove all sickness and uh, all the other concerns, Father, that surround that kind of thing. Lord, that you would just... Uh, Lord, you'd step in. You'd do. You you you'd do. Uh, you'd protect us, God. You'd take care of us, Father. You've been good to us, God, beyond what any of us deserve, God. And I pray, God, this morning that you'd be glorified, Lord, by uh, by our time together now. In Jesus' name, Amen. So let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to get back to John. So, uh, but take your Bible and go to the book of Matthew with me, real quick. Uh, We're talking about the life of John, obviously, and so Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, uh, John loses his head, obviously, uh, at the end of his life, and that's what we're looking at this morning, uh, is uh, losing your head for Christ, right? John takes a stand, and it costs him, Uh, and so uh, John chapter 14, uh, and we're going to look at verse number 3 there, John chapter 14 uh, and verse number 3. And I don't know what I did with my glasses, but uh, John chapter 14 and verse number 3. The uh, Bible says, uh, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee, thank you, Allison, uh, it is not lawful for thee uh, to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she being uh, before instructed of her mother said, give me here John Baptist's head and a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake and them that sat Uh, with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her and sent and beheaded John in the prison and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel and she brought it to her mother and the disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Flip over real quick to Mark chapter 6 with me. Mark chapter 6 and look at verse number 17 there. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 17. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 17. Read a couple more verses together here. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto her, Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, uh, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly." 
And when a convenient day was come, that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in, and danced, and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And she sware unto her, uh, and he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of, the king, of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. She came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sake which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an ex- executioner, commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So here's, uh, here is the end of the life uh, of John the Baptist. Uh, it, uh, it reminds us of, uh, of a couple of things. It reminds us, first of all, that uh, the more that we, as God's people, are blessed by God, the more that the world hates us. Uh, all right? And uh, listen, uh, often, in fact, the more that you're blessed by God, the more that the religious people in this world hate you, too. Uh, and so uh, there is that. The, uh, uh, the other thing that we see is we see the cause of this, right, is John takes a stand uh, in this passage against divorce. Could have been anything, uh, really. It could have been anything. Um, and, uh, and it would have been the demise, obviously, of John's life. But, uh, but in this case, it's obviously divorce. And so we're going to look at uh, what the Scripture has to say. Uh, concerning that matter uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, just uh, listen, it could have, uh, like I said, it, it really could have been just about anything, uh, any kind of evil, any kind of wickedness uh, could have brought about the demise of John. Uh, but it did end up being uh, divorce. It ended up being the thing. And so uh, we'll see how the world uses, what the world does when we take a stand for biblical values and for biblical uh, truth. And so uh, you see what happens. But the beheading of John was such a prominent event uh, that it's, uh, this is the only story in the whole book of Mark that isn't about Christ. It was such an important, such a prominent event that it's the only story in the book of Mark that's not about Christ. And when, uh, when Herod, in fact, later on when Herod hears uh, about the works of Christ, he thinks that it's John who's risen from the dead. That's how prominent this, this, uh, this story was, how much it weighed on Herod, how much, uh, how much influence it had in, in the country uh, during that time. So we're going to look at that this morning. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, uh, and uh, we'll jump right into this. Lord, we love you. We are thankful for the Scriptures. Father, we're thankful for the Word of God. We pray, God, that we would be uh, attentive to them now in Jesus' name. Amen. So first and foremost, we look at the provoker. Uh, of the beheading what what provoked this beheading why did john get beheaded well john got beheaded because he took a stand uh against herod uh divorce and then marriage to herodias uh listen there's a there are a lot of messages around uh that surround the beheading of john the baptist but a lot of them don't deal with the reason that john was beheaded uh right they uh they just kind of skirt over the fact but uh, but the reality is, is he was beheaded because he took a stand uh, against divorce uh, and against uh, certainly against Herod's divorce and then remarriage to Herodias and Herodias's divorce and her remarriage then to Herod. And so uh, he took a stand for that. Uh, and by the way, and listen, uh, divorce is a tough topic and still uh, brings about a lot of animosity from people. Uh, people do not like it when you talk about divorce. Um, both uh, the lost world doesn't like it and Christianity doesn't like it. Um, uh, but, uh, and listen, even the world knows, right? Even the world knows if, if you get a hold of somebody who's, uh, who's a, who really is a good thinker on, on culture uh, and on the demise of culture, you'll find that all of them will attribute the lack of morality uh, and the demise of our culture and society, they will, they, they will always attribute it to the loss of the structure of the family. All right? That's, uh, that's where it comes from. There's the, the father's not in the home. Uh, the, there's, there's divorce and remarriage, the, the blending of families. 
um, has made it very difficult. Uh, and that, uh, that, listen, that causes all kinds of fractures in the foundation of culture and society. Listen, every society, every culture is based upon the family. That's the foundation of every culture. Family is the foundation. So as the family goes, so goes the nation. Uh, and so that's what we see uh, even in this passage, right? And so, uh, listen, with an increase in divorce comes a decrease in morality. The two things go hand in hand with one another. Uh, the, 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 more, the, the, the higher that the, the divorce totals go up, the lower that morality sinks in a nation. And so it matters, uh, and we should, uh, we should give it proper due as Christians, right? Uh, I've told people a million times uh, concerning the, con- the, 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 the argument surrounding uh, whether same-sex marriage is permissible or not, that we lost that fight when we started accepting that divorce, that you could just divorce your spouse for any reason. Right? When Christianity start to accept, started to accept the fact that you can just divorce for any reason, uh, that you know, there, there's nothing wrong with it, uh, we lost the fight over the sanctity of marriage. Uh, and so you need to, we, we ought to take it seriously. So uh, we'll look uh, real quick here uh, at the defilement right, in, the, in the practice. This, uh, the, story is, uh, the, the story that we find before us here of... Uh, of Herod taking his uh, brother Philip's wife um, is no different than the stories we hear all the time uh, in the news about celebrities, right? Uh, they are more, most celebrities are more immoral than they are famous. Uh, and they plaza, they're they all over our news and everything else, but common folk are just as immoral in our present day and age as the celebrities are. The only difference is, is they're just not on the news all the time, right? And so, uh, listen, the historians say uh, that all of this uh, started when uh, Herod stopped to see his brother Philip uh, on his way to Rome. Uh, Herod becomes infatuated uh, with Philip's wife, Herodias, um, and the fact that they are both married doesn't seem to stand in the way uh, of the situation. And so... uh, it was not, uh, this was not all just Herod, obviously. Herodias was an arrogant, headstrong, ambitious woman uh, who was just looking to up-level her social status. Uh, and Herod was a great opportunity. Uh, and the same thing still goes on in society around us uh, with, uh, with, the situ- with the situations that we see play out, right? We just a few years back, we had the whole thing play out with Harvey Weinstein, uh, and the uh, hashtag Me Too movement and all that garbage, uh, and a bunch of women who tried to up-level their social status by using him, uh, and he uh, trying to get fulfill his lustful desires by using them, uh, and then all of a sudden fingers start getting pointed, and everybody's, uh, everybody's feeling like they're a victim, when in reality they're not victims, they're participants. Uh, right? And so... That's what we see take place here with Herodias, right? Uh, Herod was, uh, this was a perfect opportunity, uh, right? Herod was a perfect opportunity for Herodias to move up, to increase her wealth, uh, to increase her influence, her fame. Uh, Listen, Philip was a nice guy, but he didn't have any pull. He had no influence, right? And so, uh, so Herod was somebody uh, so Herodias takes her daughter, uh, Salome, uh, and marries Herod. Uh, and listen, regardless of whatever the advantages or justifications uh, for divorce and remarriage are, um, it, uh, they're always based in the same thing. Scripture tells you in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Uh, and listen, whatever justification has come up with by the world for uh, you know, no-fault divorce and all this other stuff, uh, none of it, uh, it, it's all based in the same thing. It's based in those three problems right there. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's where divorce comes from. That's where all sin, by the way, comes from. Divorce is not uh, unique 
right? Uh, it's not that uh, divorce is up here and all the other sins are down here. And if you get divorced, you're, uh, you're far worse than everybody else. That's not the concept. Uh, but the concept is to accept uh, what Scripture has to say about divorce uh, and not play it off as justified somehow. Uh, and so, listen, if you, you start justifying uh, divorce and remarriage, that's a slippery slope. What else are you going to justify? Right? You've got you've to start justifying some other things if that's where you're going to start. Listen, maybe legal as far as the law of the land is concerned, uh, but, it's not, uh, but it's not acceptable before God. Listen, it may have been legal, right? Herod may have gone about all the legal measures in order to make Herodias his wife, uh, but that doesn't make it pure, doesn't make it holy, doesn't make it clean by any stretch of the imagination. Listen, as a Christian... It's very important that we understand, that we grasp the concept that the law does not determine morality. Just because something is acceptable legally doesn't mean that it is moral. Uh, And listen, morality should influence the law, but the law does not influence morality. It does not determine what is moral and what is not moral. If you're going to live by the laws of the land, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble because there's a whole lot of laws of the land that are nothing but sin. And so uh, we ought not mess around with that kind of stuff. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verse number 11 uh, says, And he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Listen, Scripture, uh, scripture really doesn't mince words about it. Scripture is very plain, very clean, clear about what it is. Right? There's no, uh, God, uh, God doesn't go, well, accept that, right? Uh, listen, we're always looking for an exception for our sin. Right? Whether it's alcohol, whether it's alcohol or uh, whether it's, in this case, divorce, Right? Whatever it is that is your sin, you're always looking for an exception clause for yours. God doesn't give exception clauses in Scripture. The only, the only solution to your problem is repentance. Uh, and so, listen, even the lost in the world, all the genuine thinkers anyways, will tell you that divorce is devastating, it's immoral, and uh, it's even worse when kids are involved. Right? Listen, every genuine thinker in the world will tell you that. There's none of them that will tell you that, well, you know, divorce is really kind of here nor there. Really doesn't matter. Uh, it matters. Uh, and so we see the destructiveness uh, of the practice. You see the destructiveness uh, of the practice. The, the example uh, that we have here of Herod and Herodias reminds us that divorce should never uh, be encouraged, right? It should almost never be encouraged as the morally acceptable decision. Why should it not be encouraged as morally acceptable decision? Number one, because it destroys people. Listen, divorce destroys people. Taking a biblical stand against it certainly destroyed John the Baptist. He lost his head over it. Uh, listen, uh, Herodias wanted him dead from the first time that, he, uh, that, that she saw him. Mark 6, 18, where we just were there, uh, says, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she couldn't. From the first time that she ever heard John open his mouth concerning the matter, she wanted to kill him. And listen, the same thing happens in our present day and age when you stand against sin uh, and you stand against the man immorality in our present day and age. People want to kill you. Uh, Herod wanted him dead too. It's not like Herod was exempt. Matthew 14, 5 tells you, and when he uh, would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Listen, Herod wanted him dead too. Herod was just too scared of the crowd to do it. Uh, all right, so Herodias wants him dead because she's involved in the sin that he's speaking against. Herod wants him dead because he's involved in the sin that John's speaking against. And listen, the same thing happens in our present day and age. Whenever you speak out against sin, 
The people who are in it want you dead. They'd kill you if they could. Uh, nothing's changed. It's all still the same. Uh, McLaren uh, says, Lust dwells hard by hate. Sensual crimes and cruelty are closely akin. Listen, these things go right together. Immorality and, and murder go hand in hand. If you don't believe it, look at ba David and Bathsheba. Listen, it, it, murder and adultery, they go hand in hand with one another. Have all through history. Uh, and nothing has changed. Uh, mur many people who are in prison for murder in our present day are in prison for murder because of the same thing. They're in prison for murder over the exact same thing. Right? Uh, listen, uh, they, they wanted what they, they, they wanted her or they wanted him, uh, and their marriage was in the way. Uh, listen, it happens all the time. Uh, they have entire true crime series about it. Go on YouTube. You can watch undercover police officers pretend to be hitmen. Uh, and trap people uh, trying to kill their spouses. It happens all the time. And it's nothing new. Murder and adultery go right together. So it destroys people. It also destroys peace. Listen, you can't find one in ten stories of that end uh, of divorce that end amicably. Oh yeah, we still get together and go to each other's barbecues and Listen, you can't find one in ten that are like that. You say, I know somebody, yeah, you and I both know they are exce an exception to the rule if it's true. And you don't know how they really feel. They may just be waiting for their moment to kill the other person. Right? They may just still be involved in that person's life because they know that they are a trigger. They know that they're a problem. And they're doing everything they can to continue to a relationship in which they cause a problem. Listen, the reality is you can't break a solemn vow or as, a, a, as a, a divine law like marriage and not suffer the consequences of it. You can't take what the Bible says and say, you know what, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life, whether it's divorce or it's any other sin, and it not have consequences. It always has consequences. Listen, sin never promotes tranquility. Right? It always promotes trauma. Uh, that's what sin does. Uh, listen, you, you're, you're, you never live in sin peacefully. Sin is traumatic to you. It is traumatic to those around you. And listen, if you, you know that it's true because you know the way that your sin has affected others. Uh, it's traumatic. You say, well, I've never had a big sin in my life. You are deluded because all sin is big. You may be so narcissistic, you may be so selfish that you don't think that your sin has affected anybody else. But that's because the only person you care about is you. So you've never considered what it does to somebody else. You've never considered... Uh, what you, how what you say affects somebody else or how, what your, how your actions affect somebody else because the only person you care about is the person staring back at you in the mirror. But sin is traumatic. Divorce always disturbs the peace. If you ask any police officer, tell me what the, num t tell me what the most calls that you get uh, are over. Right, the, mo the, the, the most domestic violence calls, what are they over? It's over this issue right here. The world would have you believe it's over the issue of them trying to stay in the same home when in reality it's over, the issue tends to be over them not being in the same home. It's because one person wants out and one person doesn't. Divorce disturbs the pre peace. Listen, history tells you that divorce and that, that the divorce and remarriage of Herod and Herodias disturbed the peace for Herod. Listen, Aretas, which is his former father-in-law, uh, his country ends up attacking Herod and destroying half of Herod's army because Herod divorced his daughter. 
You know why? Because there's no such thing as breaking a vow like that and walking away without consequence. Just doesn't work. There's no such thing as breaking a vow like that and nobody got hurt. Oh, no, in our, in our divorce, nobody got hurt. No, you're so narcissistic that just because you didn't suffer pain, you think nobody else did. That's the problem. Listen, peace always comes in the pursuit of, pur- uh, of purity. And unrest always comes in the pursuit of immorality. Listen, if you're, going to, if you're going to chase that which God tells you not to chase, if you're going to go after that which God tells you to leave alone, you're going to live a very, very, uh, man, unpeaceful life. If you'll simply chase after what God tells you to chase, go after what God tells you to go after, uh, you'll find peace in it. And we see the denouncing of the practice. John denounces the practice. John the Baptist obviously condemns it. All right? Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, look, uh, look at Mark chapter 6 there in verse number 18. John, John condemns it there. For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. John, uh, John was not naive. Right? Uh, John knows exactly what this condemnation is going to cause. He knows that this condemnation is putting him in harm's way. It took courage for John to stand up in front of Herod and Herodias, and say, this isn't right before God. And listen, what God needs is He needs Christians who have the courage to stand up in the face of the world, and even in the face of the religious world, and say, this is not right before God. Listen, uh, as courageous as John's rebuke of of Herod's immoral life choice was, uh, in our present day and age, he would be criticized by most preachers. Well, you can't say that. doesn't apply to everybody. You know, you, you need to leave more exceptions. You need to leave more loopholes. You can't hold people to, to expectations like that. You don't understand the present culture. You don't understand the present day and age. John didn't care about the present day and age. John didn't care about the culture. John didn't care about Herod's power. John cared about what the Bible says. And we as Christians need to be concerned with what the Bible says again. We need to be concerned about what the Bible says about divorce. We need to be concerned about what the Bible says about other sins too. Uh, The Christianity of today would have labeled John a fanatic. And unpolished. Ah, you know, John's just uncouth and he's kind of crazy. You know, John, you know he was out in the wilderness eating crickets, right? The guy's a little nuts. John doesn't speak for all of us. Right? That's, that, that's what you'd find. They'd call him old-fashioned and ill-tempered, right? Uh, you know, John, John's just, uh, you know... He's just a bit of a weirdo, that guy. Uh, right? That's, uh, that's what you would find with John there, right? Uh, listen, A.T. Robertson says it was a blunt and brave thing that John said. It cost him his head, but it is better to have, a, to have a head like John the Baptist and lose it than to have an ordinary head and keep it. Listen, it's better to take a stand and lose than to never take a stand and win. We as Christians ought to take a stand. We see the Bible condemns it as well. John condemns it, which is all well and good, but the Bible condemns it too. Listen, what John was quoting from when he says it's against the law, he's quoting from the Old Testament. Right? But you've got Scripture, by the way, throughout all the New Testament concerning the matter too. Listen, God hates divorce. There's no other way around it. And when we expend energy in defense of divorce, we're expending energy... In, in defense of something that God hates. Listen, when you, when, when you expend energy in defense of sin, whether it's divorce or anything else, when you expend energy in defense of it, you're defending energy in defense of something that God says, I'm not for that. I hate that garbage. Why would you expend your energy as a Christian trying to defend something that God doesn't defend? In fact, something that God condemns. Why would you spend that kind of energy 
as a Christian doing that. No wonder Christianity is so wore out. Uh, right? Listen, it's not that there's not grace for divorce or grace for any sin. Right? But grace doesn't mean that God accepts it. It means that God is, is overwhelming, right, His hate with His love. That's what that means. That's why Paul says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Right? Uh, look at Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 there. For the, uh, for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that He hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, and saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take, it, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Listen, in Malachi, God says very simply, I hate putting away. That's divorce. That's what he's talking about. You remember, like Joseph, wanted to put away Mary. Right? That's what he's talking about. Uh, listen, the, the, the New Testament's no, no more kind uh, concerning the matter. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse number 11. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Listen, God's, not, God's pretty clear about it. Luke 16, 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Listen, God didn't just suddenly go, well, you know what? I was wrong about all that divorce stuff. I was wrong about all that. You know what? I never thought, I never thought that, you know, that there would be the problems that you face in 2021. I never thought that there, that there would be the trials, the tribulation, the heartaches of a year, uh, uh, of uh, of your present society. I was so wrong about this thing of divorce. That's old thinking of me. I, I'm sorry about that. God never apologizes for it. God's very clear concerning it. If you don't believe it, look at what Paul has to say. Paul says in Romans 7, verse 2, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. What does Paul tell you? Paul says, hey, nothing's changed. Right? Paul says, nothing's changed. Uh Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Right? What does Paul say? What Paul says is very simply this. Just because you got saved doesn't mean your spouse got saved. And just because your spouse didn't get saved isn't any excuse for you to, isn't any excuse for you to divorce them. That's what Paul says. Christ goes on to say in Matthew chapter 19, verse 7, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto him, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put, to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. What does Jesus tell him? He tells him, Hey, you want to know what, what uh, you know why divorce happens? Because you got a hard heart. That's why. Divorce is the result of the hardness of heart. Listen, I, it can't be stated any more plainly or any more simply. That doesn't mean that both parties in a divorce have a hard heart, but I'm telling you, one of them does. One of them, uh, if not both of them, have a hard heart, and that's the reason they're getting divorced. You say, no, they just don't get along. You're not the same person I married. Listen, all of that is garbage. Uh, it's, uh, it's very simple, right? It means that somebody in that marriage is unwilling to forgive and is unwilling to try to resolve the issues because their heart is hard. You say, yeah, but I've got justification for my hard heart. Not if you're a believer, you don't. If you're a Christian, there is no justification for it. Because the Scripture tells you to forgive just like Christ forgave. 
It's pretty simple. It should go without saying, right, that divorce is the result of hardness of heart. Who else would put their children through a divorce except for somebody who's got a hard heart? Who else would take their children uh, from their father or from their mother? Who else would, would divide the loyalties of their children other than someone with a hard heart? You say, yeah, but, you know, uh, I need to be happy too. Choosing your happiness over your children's happiness is not acceptable. It's narcissistic and selfish. And that's the truth. And listen, that's what sin is. Sin is always narcissistic and selfish, whether it's divorce or anything else. Uh, listen, anybody who's ever participated in, anybody who's ever observed a divorce or its aftermath will tell you that the result, uh, that the reason for it, the result of it, was because of exactly that, a hardness of heart, a lack of love, right? Right? Listen, all that divorce does is reveals that somebody is selfish, they are stubborn, that they lack love, and they lack care for others. That is all that divorce reveals. That doesn't mean that both parties in a divorce are that way, but I'm telling you, somebody in that divorce is stubborn, doesn't care about loving others, doesn't care about others, uh, is selfish, and only cares about their own personal wants and desires. And that's why the divorce is happening. And Herod and Herodias are a perfect example of it. Herod saw her and said, man, I'd like to sleep with her. She saw Herod and said, man, would that guy give me status. Both of them were selfish. They deserved each other. That's what divorce is. Listen, you can't claim to handle the Word of God with any type of integrity and then turn around and act as though God doesn't take sides in a divorce. That God doesn't care about divorce. Do whatever you want. Stay married, get divorced. God has no concern for it. God's just going to turn a blind eye. No, He's not. He is not. You better be sure that you're in that marriage, that you're the one doing everything to keep that thing together. You don't want to be the one on the other side of it. Lastly, we'll look real quickly here at the defending uh, of the practice, the defending of the practice. Uh, listen, Herod and Herodias uh, are, def are, are proof positive that when it's defended, it's defended viciously. You very rarely hear anybody say, well, you know what, let's agree to disagree on this thing of divorce. No, if you take a stand against it, they will slice you to pieces. They will find whatever you got in your life. They'll dig it up. They'll hang it out on the wire. They will find some way to justify their sin. Nothing has changed. Listen, to oppose their actions is to take your life in your hands. Even for many present-day Christians, right? To say anything concerning divorce is still the same. Uh... Listen, the perpetrator in a divorce is not the perpetrator because they are kind and tolerant. Nobody gets divorced because, listen, I am so kind and I'm so tolerant that I'm going to go ahead and just, I, I, I need to divorce you. I'm too kind for you. That's not the way divorce goes down. I'm too good for you. You're not good enough for me. You're not living up to my expectations. Me, my, I, those words all precede a divorce. Listen, when you said I do, you said we. You became we. You became us. You're not a me, my, I anymore. Uh, listen, the, the church ought to be a beacon of love, kindness, and tolerance. You know what it means to be a beacon of love, kindness, and tolerance? Take a stand for the sanctity of marriage. Take a stand for the sanctity of the marriage vows. Uh, we should do everything in our power to ensure that our marriages and the marriages of those around us stay intact. That we preach love. That we preach tolerance. Listen. That, uh, that we preach kindness. 
Let me tell you something. If you don't have love, kindness, and tolerance, your marriage won't last. Period. Because let me tell you what marriage is a whole lot of. It is a whole lot of tolerating the other person. Because you don't agree. You are two different people and you will not agree on everything and you are going to have to tolerate them. And you know what's going to happen? They are going to be very unkind. And your kindness is going to have to overcome. You're going to have to be so kind. And listen, despite what everybody would have you believe, you won't always be in love with the person that you said I do to. There will be days when you wish they wouldn't come home. But love says, I'll, I'll love enough for, for both of us on the days you're not. Everybody says marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Uh, right? Or it's 100% this, it's 100% that. Listen, you can divide that thing up however you want to divide it up. The reality of the matter is, if you, don't, if you are not a person who is loving, you are not a person who is kind, and you are not a person who is tolerant, you should not get married. Because you are a menace, and you will destroy a marriage. It's just the reality of it. It's defended viciously, it's defended pervertedly too. Herod and Herodias were willing to murder in defense of their actions. They were willing to kill this guy, for saying, what you're doing is unlawful. Listen, it's the same thing, right? Whenever we hear of a police officer being shot at a traffic stop, it always blows our mind. Somebody got pulled over for a speeding ticket and shot the cop. Right? It's usually because the person has a warrant out for something much larger. But you'd think it was crazy, right? You, it never crosses your mind when you're pulled over for a speeding ticket. I should just shoot this guy and make a run for it. Right? But listen, that's literally what happens in this case. Listen, many today are willing to murder in defense of their actions as well. They're certainly willing to murder Scripture in defense of their actions. Here's what happens when it comes to divorce, right? And this is not unique to, 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 uh, to the concept of divorce. This happens with a lot of sin, right? They start looking for loopholes. What's the exception? What's the exception to divorce? So here's what people say. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be, uh, new, be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, that means that I'm not subject to the vows I made prior to being saved because now I'm a new creature. Right? Or now my prior divorce before I got saved doesn't mean anything because I'm a new creature. You're a new creature spiritually and not physically. Uh, listen, it's very sloppy doctrine to start messing around with it that way. If you're going to mess with it that way, then you'd have to take verse 18 as well, which says, And all things uh, are of God, and who hath, reconciled, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ? And hath given to us a ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? It means that you're probably, if you did, if that's the situation, you're new now. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Go reconcile your marriage. Yep. There's not a loophole for you to get out of it. Uh, here's probably the favorite one, right? Matthew chapter five, verse thir- thirty-two. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is uh, divorced committeth adultery. Right? Uh, he tells you again in Matthew 19, 9, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except, for it, be, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Right? There's that word fornication. Fornication. If they, if they commit fornication, you're allowed to divorce them. Right? Fornication, by the way, is a very broad term takes in a whole lot of different types of sexual sin in Scripture. Uh, most often, though, uh, sins that are, uh, sexual sins that are committed before marriage, uh, that's what it is. Uh, that's, by the way, why the word adultery appears in the same passage as the word fornication. Right? They're together in the passage for that cause. Uh, and so, listen, uh, the, what you have to remember is... This is written to the Jews, right? 
who live in a time, especially during that time when betrothal is a thing, right? So as a young lady, your father betrothed you to some young man. And from that point on, you were considered his wife. Uh, And by the way, we didn't have nearly as much divorce when the father did choose as we have now. There's something to think about, Uh, right? Uh, But because then it mattered what your family was and what their family was. Now it doesn't matter. Oh, we're in love and I don't care who knows Uh, until next week when I divorce him because I didn't know that he had hair on his toes. Uh, right and so but listen the reality of the matter is that that's you were betrothed you became from that point on you were a spouse you were basically that that person's spouse and he was yours right and so if during that period of time uh, you did something right against your spouse male or female you did something against your spouse You sinned against them in that way, and they found out about it, they could end it. If they found out about it after the marriage, they could end it. Uh, But the, uh, listen, it's just like our engagement period today, right? That's why when you, uh, that's why they talk in, uh, in Scripture about putting away, right? Joseph wanting to put away Mary. They weren't married yet. Why do you want to put her away? Why did he want to divorce her? He was going to divorce her because of that. That's why the Bible tells you, Matthew 1.18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as, uh, when as his mother, Mary, was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She was a spouse. They weren't married yet. So when Joseph talks about putting her away, he's talking about divorcing her. Uh, give you one last passage here, and then we'll close. But listen, the people remind Jesus of this later. John chapter 8, verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your father, Jesus says. Then they said to him, this is the, the Pharisees really and the Sadducees speaking, but we be, not, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. What are they saying? They said, we know how you were born. We know about Mary and Joseph. You were born of fornication. Right? Listen, uh, many believers, including preachers, have made a practice now of trying to give exception clauses for divorce which has led to exception clauses for all the other sins too right there's an exception clause now for uh, for alcohol it's a disease right well you're born that way right everybody's born that way now let me tell you something yeah you're born that way scripture tells you you were conceived in sin genius You were born with the capacity to be Hitler. What are you talking about? Of course you were born that way. That's no excuse for you having a problem with alcohol. No excuse for you having a problem with divorce. No excuse for you having a problem with any other sin. Listen, it's a slippery slope. The reality is the majority of divorces, even among believers, in our our present day and age, have nothing to do with fornication or adultery if you want to try and use that exception. They have virtually nothing to do with that. It has to do with the hardness of one or both individuals involved in the marriage. Listen, we need to make it a priority that our marriages be filled with love, with kindness, and with tolerance. Listen, you're, and, and you should do your best so that your spouse doesn't have to tolerate you. Listen, it's really simple, right? You should love your spouse. And your spouse should love you. But if you're finding it hard because of something that is going on in your marriage, then at least be kind. Right? At least be kind. Treat your spouse as you would somebody, anybody else in the world if you had a disagreement with them. You wouldn't hurl insults at them. Or any of that kind of stuff. So be kind. You say, well, I've tried to love them. That's not working. I've tried to be kind. What should I do now? Tolerate them. Put up with it. Say, I'm tired of putting up with it. 
Ah, get off of your, your high horse. It's not like they're not putting up with you. Shockingly, we think that we, the person we see in the mirror, doesn't have to, they don't have to be tolerated. Everybody just loves me. I mean, I'm the most lovable person in the world. I know it's probably a newsflash to you, but there's a lot of people in this world that are doing nothing more than putting up with you. It's just reality. They're just putting up with you. But your spouse shouldn't have to be one of them. You should do everything in your power to make yourself lovable. Whatever that means. Listen. Uh, if, if we did make it a priority that our marriages be filled with love, kindness, and tolerance, uh, we'd have little to no divorce except in the rarest of occasions when there's spousal abuse or something like that going on. Divorce would be a rare thing. It would be rare for you to talk to somebody and them say, yeah, this is my second wife. This is my second husband. It'd be rare to hear that. Instead of like it is presently, it's common to hear it. Those things ought not be common among us as Christians. Imagine, right? Just imagine that that's what you heard, right? That instead of it being divorce, it was alcohol, right? Well, hey, this is only my third relapse. I'm doing good, right? I've only got drunk three times this week. I feel like my Christian life's really on track. You say, well, that doesn't sound right either. Yeah, it doesn't sound right when we say this is my second wife, this is my third wife, this is my third husband. Right? That doesn't sound right either. We need to do everything we can to protect the sanctity of marriage and to protect biblical values, biblical morals, like Scripture tells us to do. We'll talk next week about the particulars of the beheadings. Father, we thank you for the Scriptures. We're thankful for the Word of God, Lord. I pray, Lord, that I said everything I should have said this morning. Pray I didn't say anything I shouldn't have said, God. And I pray that you've been glorified by it now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad you joined us this morning. Uh, We'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock. So be here or be square. All right. Have a great day.